We'll be taking some questions, some input, your comments. And uh, please feel free to direct your questions to either of them. You please introduce yourself and tell us your affiliation. So we'll start with the first four. Uh, good evening. My name is Tapiwa Jonah. I'm doing CT at University of Johannesburg. Uh, my question is directed to Prof Mtambara. Uh, you speak about continental integration, but my point is we have President like Kwame Nkrumah. We had President like Kwame Nkrumah who had the same vision. We had Kenil Gaddafi, we had the same vision. So do you think or do you view this as going to succeed or there are many changes that we need to do in order to make continental integration a success? Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, Professor Alexander Mizev, visiting professor from uh, Russia. Uh, professor Mutambara, I would like to ask you a question uh, concerning the African traditional knowledges connected with space research. Because what we know from, for example, culture of the Dogon people, Dogon people knows much more about space than the West knows. So my question is, what would be the role of the African traditional knowledges in the competition in the space? Greetings to the city. Uh, my name is Tato. Uh, it is interesting that we speak of Africa integration, but looking at uh, the economies of scale from China, I mean, they have uh, this massive firewall that is uh, peeling from the West. So I think even as for an African integration, we need to have a 4D approach, which I would like to call decolonization, delinking, decommodification, and deglobalization to reglobalize. I think that is one of amongst the strategies that China have carried out in order for them to be the second largest economic uh, uh, engine in the world. And for us to be able to be integrated in how you say the space and the decolonized engineering must be implemented, we need to, or how do we break away, or how do we ourselves move away from the clashes that will have us perpetuate Millennium Mental Menu Mission? Thank you. Um, good evening, everybody. My name is Benjamin, and I'm studying um, physical sciences here in the University of Johannesburg. Um, so my question is um, directed to Professor Mutambara. So, um, okay, if we look into China, China has, uh, okay, I would say they have one same culture. If you look at into the United States, they have the same culture as well. But now if you look into Africa, we have different cultures where we have um, like the Southern, we have South Africa, we have the Congo, and uh, having to form an African Union with our different cultures, how do we integrate everything into produce something where Africa can unite? Thank you. We'll give opportunity to the, to the speakers to, to respond. Prof. Zabar, you have three questions. Uh, Kwame Kruma. There's no people, there's no leader in Africa right now who's the caliber of Gaddafi or caliber of Kwame Krumah. We have midgets running around as leaders, intellectually, I mean. No one, Mbeki was almost there, but not really. Kwame Krumah, Ben Bela, what did Kwame Krumah say? We as Ghanaians are prepared to surrender our sovereignty in part or in total in pursuit of African unity. The independence of Ghana is meaningless unless it is linked to the independence of the rest of the African continent. Ben Bela, what did he say? Let us die a little so that Rhodesia can be free. Let us die a little so that South Africa can be free. These were visionaries. So what I'm emphasizing is that their vision was way ahead of his time. You know, there was a big debate between Krumah and Nyerere in 63. Krumah was saying, guys, let's move very quickly and unite and be one block. If you get used to being a president, you will not relinquish office. Let's move quickly before you become too comfortable in your little palace as a president. And Yere was saying, no, 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 let's do it brick by brick, gradually, slowly, and then we'll get there. And Yere won the debate. But guess what? We lost the African 
integration. Because everyone now wants to be president. They will never give up. Krumah, Gaddafi were ready to surrender individual presidency for the collective African presidency. So, yes, they made their own mistakes, but the vision of integration was there. What we need are African leaders who understand that there's more to be gained by coming together than that which is lost. Traditional knowledge systems, you know, we will address that matter if we start with ourselves before we engage China, before we engage the Russians, before we engage the Americans. We will say, we want a space program. What do we know about space as Africans? What are our views about space? What are our values? What does Ubuntu say? What is our knowledge system, our indigenous knowledge system? When you are proactive, when you start with thyself, know thyself, you'll be able to address that matter and actually leverage your own wisdom. Our problem is that we don't start with ourselves. We start with China. We start with India. We start with America and Europe. We never say, I'm an African. What is my belief system? I'm an African. What do I know about space? I'm an African. What are my views about space? What is the history in my continent in terms of understanding space? So very important point you are raising. And in my framework, we'll solve it because we'll start with ourselves, our history, our culture, our... You know, as Africans, sometimes we undervalue ourselves. We think we can learn from Singapore, from Malaysia, from China. We can also learn from ourselves. Ubuntu. I am because we are. We are because I am. A person is a person because of other people. They don't have it in China. They don't have it in America. Not in Japan, but we have it. Collective success is more important than individual success. I am because we are. We are because I am. Lots of wisdom. Even when we devise and build our intelligent systems, we must input Ubuntu into our algorithms. The Americans can't do it because they don't know what Ubuntu is. So when we do the programming with Professor Marwala, we're going to be programming Ubuntu into computers. <laughs> 4D. 4D. Excellent 4D. Those 4Ds are great. Let's use them and empower ourselves. One thing I like from China, by the way, you know what he said? I hope you are listening. Because of nuclear weapons, because of the satellite program, we are very confident. We are bowling out of control because we have nuclear weapons. They give us confidence. We are rock stars because we have satellites. You must understand this. And you know what the Americans are saying? We must stop the spreading of nuclear weapons. We must denuclearize. Do you know what happened in this country? South Africa, I hope you know this. When we're moving towards 1990, the Boers, South African racist regime was working towards creating a nuclear weapon, a nuclear bomb. They were very close. And when Mandela and them were coming from prison, they quickly destroyed the technology and gave it to Israel. They were comfortable with a racist South African regime owning nuclear weapons, but not comfortable with an African brother having nuclear weapons. Ah, I hope you know that. So I'm emphasizing that our brothers teach us a lot. Economic power also is linked to military power. It gives you confidence. I'm not pushing for nuclear weapons. I'm pushing for satellite technology. <laughs> but you must understand that when you have a satellite, when you have two bombs, one satellite, two bombs, the basis of Deng Xiaoping's revolution was strength. It gives you confidence that, no, you know what, uh, if it comes to nuclear weapons, uh, we'll nuke each other. It's called mutually assured destruction. When the Africans have nuclear weapons, no one will take us for granted because we can nuke back. No one will mess around the Chinese because they've got nuclear weapons. The Russians have nuclear weapons. The French do have them. Israel does have them. 
So when you are powerful militarily, you are respected. But I'm emphasizing the four Ds. Four Ds are important. And I know that's what you, you, you've spoken about them several times. That's why I'm smiling. You are very consistent, Mr. 4D. Same culture, China. Yes, that's a good point. India, same culture. Yes, the Americans, can you say the same? They came from all over. So it's a problem, but not too big a problem. Remember, the borders are artificial borders. Do you know there are more Swazi people in South Africa than in Swaziland? Is it Iswati? Now, what's it called? The new name now? There are more Swanas in South Africa than in Botswana. So these borders are meaningless. Why Swaziland is what? Why Botswana? Yes, there is a problem, but also the borders are artificial. We can manage our cultural differences. We can work together. You know, it's not impossible. The Germans and the French fought two wars. The French hate the Germans. The British don't like the Germans, but they're in the EU together, although the British is running away. But, but what I'm saying is don't overemphasize these cultural differences. Others have been able to manage them. And our borders are not out of our choice anyway. They were created by the Berlin Conference in 1884. So yes, there are challenges around cultural differences. They are not impossible. They can be managed and mitigated. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I should say I feel a bit sorry, firstly. Why? Because, uh, in fact, I could uh, reveal the, my little secret to you. <laughs> because uh, this speech is my first speech delivered in one African university. In the past, I have delivered many speeches in Chinese universities, but it's my first time. So, in fact, may maybe you don't, don't discover that, in fact, I am a bit nervous. That's why when I delivered my speech at the first, I forget to thank University of Joburg, <laughs> University <laughs> Joburg Confucius Institute, and also the, the libraries provide uh, me a very excellent speech course. And uh, I just wanted to add some of my comments on Honorable Professor Mutabara's uh, statement and also to add something. Why? Because my, uh, as uh, you know that my PhD uh, major is African history, and my PhD dissertation is about uh, European aid in Africa. So during my research, I'm confused. What could help developing countries, including Africa, to gain sustainable and uh, fast enough growth? Will aid play its roles? But just now, it has been proved that you Africans, of course you need aid, but you need a fair trade and a domestic resource mobilization. That is what Africa could gain a very bright future in a sustainable way in the future. I believe you agree with me. That's why, why I want to say that, because if you look at the history of the China's satellite industry, you could see it is a very good beginning and experiment lab for China to develop its domestic, domestic resource mobilization. Why? Because, for example, I would like to ask you two questions here. I believe most, uh, most of the people here, you are uh, lo local South Africans. Do you know how many in your country has Spanish space science engineers? How many do you know that? I guess maybe, Professor, you, you, you know the answer. I have read your official space agency, in short, SANASA's report. I say it hasn't given me a very exact answer, but I think, according to my experience and the guess, I think the number will not be more than 200. And could you, imagine, could you guess how many ch space scientists, engineers China has? Anyone could, could be there to say some numbers? Sorry? Uh, 200,000. Uh, that is. 
That is very close uh, answer. Three hundred thousand. There's a very large pool of human resources, but one China began its satellite industry, as I have mentioned, in the year of 1958. The size of China's space engineers, scientists, the size I think is almost equal to today's South Africa. I think at most 100 or 200. In fact, um, I have watched some TV dramas about histories. So some very young guys, young university graduates, when they got their BA or at most MA, they are sent in secret to our military base to do research about a satellite. They know nothing about the satellite, but they are under the guy, guy, guy uh, they, they receive the, the trainings from our top scientists who have received the, their trainings, education in America. But uh, these top lead scientists, they give up their very high income in America and return to New China to provide their service to our country without uh, any honors or very high salaries in dollars. I think uh, such kind of separate and uh, such kind of domestic resource mobilization, that is the key to China's success. Because if you want to have a satellite, you need billions and millions of equipment, millions of people together, thousands of departments, thousands of companies together. You need a very good, skillful management domestic resource mobilizations. But China has done it almost half a century, uh, half a century ago. That's the, the China's success because China could domest, manage its domestic resources towards one goal. I think uh, that, that has nothing to relate to today's China's GDP as large as uh, eleven trillion. Because when we want to develop our satellite, our GDP, the size is relatively small. I think we should not forget the past. If you talk about it today, we will, we will forget how China developed from a small potato of a satellite, or no, no satellite, to uh, today's satellite superpower. I think that, that is uh, maybe the other different countries could learn. And, uh, I, and, uh, and also, uh, I have uh, one personal advice, because I think uh, I know some of you, including the Honorable S.O. Pahad, you have visited Shanghai several times, and uh, I, I also David. Next time, why any one of you could visit Shanghai. I advise you to visit the Qian Xuesheng Museum and Library. Mr. Qian Xuesheng is the top Chinese scientist in the area of AI science, and he is also the chair scientist of China Satellite. And he gave up his professorship and high income in America, and he returned to China to chair the China's satellite projects. And now we have even built a museum in Shanghai to let everybody know the, the stories and to inspire the young guys, the future generations, we should uh, learn the separate. That is, uh, we could uh, give up our personal interest and uh, contribute to the, our own country. Just like uh, the JFK has said, don't ask the con what country could do you, just uh, you could ask yourself what you could do for your country. Sharp, sharp. <laughs> Thank you very much to our speakers, to Prof. Mutambara and to Dr. Min as well. Thank you. We'll take one last round of questions. I can see many interests. Dimpua Shawangu, third year international relations student. Sorry, uh, I just have like um, a comment regarding um, Mr. Oh, Mr. Mutambara, I 100% agree with him when he says that uh, we need a, a proactive approach to the space program. Another thing is we, we need an AU approach, I agree with that, but then the AU as an institution is fragmented, like uh, the institutions are weak, you know, so that, that kind of hampers you know, developments such, such as space uh, programs and stuff like that. And uh, the second thing is um, the African Union, as we see now, it's chosen a leader like um, El Sisi to take over the reins from Egypt. This guy killed the peaceful 
you know, protesters in, in Egypt, you know, AU has a history of protecting strong men. So do we really want, you know, like technology, like uh, space stuff, which can, you know, um, keep, keep an eye on people? Like, because we can use um, the satellites to keep an eye on people for communications, for good things. But with strong men there within the African Union, this technology can be used to suppress, you know, you know the other African people. And another thing is, um, is that um, concerning Dr. Min, he said that um, the Chinese, they took um, professionals or learned scholars from US secretly and then they came and then they, you know, they did that. Us, now this is a different time. We have another, um, we have an advantage. We have an opportunity, the African diaspora. There's people overseas in America, in black people of African descent, in your Harvard, in your Australia, in your what? If those people come back to Africa, it's, uh, we don't have to, you know, do all like, uh, the same thing that the uh, Chinese did. And lastly, uh, regarding that, an example is the Indians. And the Indians ordered the surface to to air missiles from 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 Russia, the S four hundreds. They didn't. They just said that um, we're gonna buy this technology from you instead of US. But we have to assemble it. You tell us how you make it. That's technology transfer, or else the deal is off. You know. So we can use mechanisms such as that instead of China giving us the technology, allowing us to use its satellites, we can build our own and uh, you know, partner, partner and like stuff like that. Yeah, thank, thank you. you very much. You are Good evening. Um, Itumeleng Maketla with Political Analysis uh, South Africa. Um, just a, a question to Professor Mutambara. Um, I very much admire your utopian view on the reintegration of Africa or, or the, the sort of uh, uh, reconnection of, of Africa going as one block. But let's have a look at what other regions have had in terms of troubles that, they, that they're experiencing now because of this particular way of thinking, this school of thought that everything must be opened up. The European Union is actually quite on a cusp, I would say, of a breaking down. It has not worked very well. The United States of America is not really a good example for us to aspire to. Uh, the South Americas, well, they never really tried to, but of course that's their own deficiencies. So with Africa, I admire as a Pan-African the, the overarching idea of the reunification, but it has failed with people that are probably even better than working amongst themselves better than we are. I, I just don't see how we can galvanize that sort of thing and, and make it a bit better than it should otherwise be. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Letuk Tula. I'm from Vets University. I'm studying astronomy and astrophysics. So my question is directed to Dr. Mtamba Ara. He said that um, we are in a better position maybe to adapt space technology better than United States and other places that have it better like China. So I want to know why. Why are we in that position? In case I didn't get the answer to that. Thank you. Thank you. It just seems that, that my speech is not interesting enough <laughs> because of my many questions is toward, towards uh, uh, your African friend. <laughs> uh, in fact, uh, it didn't matter. In fact, uh, uh, I, I would have uh, took the opportunity of Q&A to add something because uh, the African gentleman has uh, talked about uh, the China's technology transfer to Africa. I would like to add something more important thing that is related to the national security. I wonder, anyone have ever heard of the possible war between India and Pakistan in the year of 1999? I think maybe many people have the memory that, in fact, because they have fight due to the Kashmir issues, they, they are always the possible big war or small wars. But at the year, the accident and the, 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 the conflict happened in the year of two, uh, 1999. It's a, a very dangerous uh, case. 
it is almost uh, a, a big war between the two countries and the nuclear states almost uh, happened. But why the war stopped? Because that time, the Washington intervened, and they say that both sides, you should withdraw your troops. If not, we will switch off your GPS service. <coughs> Without GPS service, your missiles could not launch to your correct destination. So to any countries, if you have only one global positioning systems, it is very dangerous. If you have a better relation with the countries or due to other reasons, the, con the, the, the leading powers, they could switch off the service. Do you, could you imagine that, 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 in, that in, the, in, the, in, the, in such a kind of day, even you have a car, you don't know where you could drive to the Johannesburg University or which universities, because you always depend on your cell phone to tell you where to go. If your cell phone keeps silent, you could only stay at home. But uh, that's why, that's the meaning of the military power of the global position systems. Just like what I have talked in my presentations, besides GPS, the European Union, they are very close partner to Washington, but they still want to have their own system, that is uh, Galinor systems. And Russia, they have their Galinors. And China, now we have our Beidou systems. In fact, in recent years, many such kind of systems, they are signing some complementary agreements. That's to say that if you buy a, a SIM card, the SIM card could support two systems, either GPS, either Beidou systems. And then just the last year, uh, Beijing and Washington has signed such kind of agreement. That's to say that in the future, if you buy a cell phone, Maybe the same card could support both the Beidou system and the GPS systems. That will make the world more safer because the more competitions will make not a single country dare to switch off the GPS signals to put some potential sections towards any countries. I believe that is a good thing to the world. That is what the information I wanted to add. Thank you. I'll try to be very brief. Currency exchanges, there's always a benefit in terms of economies of scale. If we had a pan-African currency, one currency, surely we'd be able to extract better value if we are doing the deal with the RMB or the Chinese currency, as opposed to Nigeria doing it, Rwanda, Zimbabwe. So numbers make a difference. One of the major lessons from China is a lot of people, 1.3 billion Chinese working together, economies of scale. So whatever it is, there's always a benefit in terms of economies of scale. Look, when I emphasize that we don't want bilateral deals, I'm overstating my case. What I'm simply saying is that if there's gonna be a bilateral deal between South Africa and China, it must be within the context of the African agenda. We're doing this as South Africa in keeping with Agenda 2063. We're doing this as Algeria because of that decision at the AU. We're doing this thing as Zimbabwe because that's what Comesa is about. That's what the SADC position is. In other words, when we relate bilaterally, it must be informed by what is good for the region, what is good for the continent. The continent must be the starting point. Uh, the AU is weak, yes, but fix it. I'm not gl glorifying the AU, I'm glorifying continental integration. I told you, Krumah lost to Nyerere. If Krumah had won, if Gaddafi had won, will be in a different space. This creature called the AU is a compromise arrangement. It's a dysfunctional entity because Krumah lost. But however, let's start with the AU, the CFTA, the African framework, and fix what is wrong with it, but also we need leadership. That's why I was very harsh on the African leader. Without leadership, there'll be no AU. But fix it. Don't abandon it. Technology has potential for abuse. This is the 
thing about technology, by the way, any technology is a double-edged sword. If you're not careful, these dictators in Africa will be using satellite technology to monitor you and crush you when you go on demonstration, oppress you, steal your votes during elections. Yes, technology plus values is what will drive our continents. Technology on its own is not the answer. It could be the problem. It could be the issue. Social media can be antisocial. The internet is supposed to connect us, but it can also divide us. There are trolls on the internet. There's cyber security and insecurity. So point taken. That's why we need to start with the values. Start with what we want as Africans so that our satellites will be used for development, for economic development, not to spy on citizens or to destroy them or to oppress them. But the danger is there. Africa <clears throat> diaspora, very important. That's why I'm emphasizing Pan-African buy-in. Can you imagine all those African-American scientists, the African astronauts, if they're also part of our agenda, the Caribbeans, the Africans in Brazil, in Argentina, beyond the 1.3 billion on the continent. Can you imagine the, imagine the expertise, the cash from Oprah Winfrey, from Michael, if they were conscious? Michael Jordan, who's conscious? Obama, who's conscious? No, these bankrupt ones we have. There is scope for buy-in and ownership if we work together as Africans across the globe. And the diaspora, uh, can give us an opportunity. By the way, I believe we can even move faster than China. I said China was able to move 400 million people from poverty over 30 years. Can you imagine our strength now? There's the ICT revolution. There's the fourth industrial revolution. Economies are globally connected. If we get our act together as Africans, probably we could actually move faster in terms of poverty alleviation than China, because when they did it from 1958, 1970, 1978 to now, these things were not there. The internet was not there. Social media wasn't there. Right now, all you need is a good brain and a computer, and you can build an empire. So I want us to learn from China. China was poor like us. China is now a rock star economy. It can be done. Let us learn from them and work with them to become superstars. India, technology transfer, very important. We don't want to assemble. For example, here we, in South Africa, we assemble Mercedes-Benz, we assemble you know, Ford, we assemble BM. We don't want that. Design your own car. Build your own car. Buy your own car. Can you imagine if we were to produce one truck in Africa, in, uh, designed in Mpumalanga, called the Ubuntu car. And then at the AU, we decide that every government must buy 2,000. Already there's a market. We said 1.3 billion Africans. That's a market for our products. So technology transfer is very important. Don't, don't just allow the Chinese to come and assemble, the Americans to come and assemble. Let us have the technology transferred to our people. Let us own the technology. Let us be entrepreneurs. Let us own the intellectual property beyond assembling, beyond using other people's technology. We can learn from India. We can learn from China. Don't tell me that EU is utopia. Don't look, the, the, first and foremost, the EU is doing very well. They have problems with Britain, but there is so much that has been achieved by the EU. The EU has done very well. NAFTA has done very well. ASEAN has done very well. There might be problems. Fix it, don't destroy it. There are lessons to learn from the EU, from ASEAN, from NAFTA. And by the way, you compare yourself with the Europeans. The Europeans were never colonized and given artificial boundaries. So how dare you stick your head above your hind legs and compare the AU in the EU. The boundaries, the borders in Africa are not ours. Germany for the Germans, Britain for the British, French for the French, and so on, and they're coming to get the, out of their own volition. We have artificial boundaries. 
where people were, there are Swazi people here, Swazi that side, Debele people. Said, so in Africa, we don't have a choice, by the way, unlike the Europeans, because those boundaries are meaningless. And in any case, it's a survival issue. We will not survive under globalization as small little countries. So yes, there are challenges, but it's not utopia. Let's work hard. Let's make it happen. Let's make SADAC work, COMESA, the EAC, Maghrib, uh, ECOWAS. Those blocks must function, and the AU must work. So you can't compare the challenges of NAFTA, the challenges of the AU, the challenges of ASEAN with the African continent. We have not even tried. The AU has not even tried. The United States of Africa has not been put in place. So let's not give up the fight. Let us work together and make it happen. Do you know, uh, our colleagues are here from Russia, you know, they destroyed the USSR at the instigation of the Americans. The Americans promoted the disintegration of the United USSR. I could care less the challenges they had in the USSR. They should have fixed those problems and remain united for scale. Do you realize that the biggest war that America ever fought was to keep America together? Forget First World War. Forget Second World War. Mickey Mouse Wars. The biggest war fought in America was the Civil War. The South versus the North. The America versus America. They fought a vicious war, the Americans, to keep America together. The Civil War was fought to keep America together. America is big today, 325 million people, $19 trillion GDP. That unity was not cheap to keep the United States together. It was not cheap. They fought a civil war. And more people, go and Google, more people died during the civil war in America than in the Second World War than in the first world in terms of Americans. Why did they do that? Dying to keep the northern, what did they break up? Why did they leave California to go on its own? No, California, <laughs> California can be the, the third biggest economy on its own. They will never allow California to go free because they understand economies of scale. And yet they cheat the Russians, encourage them to destroy the USSR. They encourage little you and me to be fragmented. Shame on us. Shame on you. Madam Africa, Mr. Africa. Last question on leapfrogging. My brother, what I'm saying is, if we are clever, if we are entrepreneurial, if we are creative, some of these sophisticated technologies will be easier to apply, cheaper to apply, and more effective in our environment because of the absence of what are called legacy problems, infrastructure legacy problems, infrastructure sunk costs. Here's the illustration. London has wires, electrical cables, telephony cables, everywhere in London, in New York. No, Tito has nothing. Mupumanaga, nothing. Kumasi, zip zero. So guess what? You can go wireless power, wireless telephony, wireless everything, which means it's easier because you have no legacy to protect. In London, in New York, they have to put the wireless infrastructure on top of the wires because they've invested in the wires. So they have to make sure somehow they leverage the infrastructure they have in place and make sure they don't lose much money from the investment. In Dotito, there's zero investment in wires. So we go satellite, we go wireless. Not because we are any better than them, but because we have nothing. So poverty becomes an advantage. Lack of development becomes an advantage. And I gave you an example of Mupesa. It doesn't mean the Americans don't know how to do Mupesa or to do Echo Cash. They, they own the technologies. They know them better than us. But they can't commercialize it because there are so many banks. There's a bank in your bedroom. There's a bank downstairs. Why would you bank on a phone? But in a whole village, in a whole town, there's no brick and mortar bank. 
80% of the people are unbanked. 80% of the people have no access to brick and mortar banking. That's poverty. But an opportunity to go mobile banking platform. An opportunity for eco cash. An opportunity for Mopesa. I'm saying to you, look at all those elements of the fourth industrial revolution. Cloud computing. Quantum computing. Blockchain technologies. Nanotechnologies. Human augmentation, augmented reality, artificial intelligence, mechatronics and robotics. Look at them and say, isn't there a way as a poor African without infrastructure, I can actually have an advantage over Japan, an advantage over New York because of my poverty. So that's what I'm emphasizing by saying, if you are clever, if you are creative, there's an opportunity to leapfrog, to skip a generation of technology, to move from the second generation technology where we are to the fourth industrial revolution. I'm saying don't lose heart because you are poor. Don't lose heart because you have no infrastructure. It could be an opportunity for you to embrace a much more advanced type of stock technology. So I want to end on this point of hope and say, Africans must not lose heart. There is an opportunity for us to run where others walked. But we need to learn from China. We need to learn from ourselves. We need to work together as the continent. I thank you so very much. And by the way, by the way, I know some of you think that you're going to be rock stars. I'm a rock star engineer. I'm a rock star professor. I'm a managing director. I'm a journalist, superstar journalist. You are a superstar nothing until Africa is a superstar economy. You will never be respected as an African until the African continent has done well as a continent. I thank you so very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to our speakers. And on that note, colleagues, students, we are now at the roundoff stage of this um, seminar. Remember, to, as we leave this hall today, to be proactive, be a global player, and be a producer. All right? Yeah. Thank you. On behalf of the Confucius Institute, I would like to thank our speakers. Dr. Chumin and Prof. Arthur Mutambara for, the speech, for, for this, uh, your presentations and uh, your responses to the questions for, for, for this evening. And um, we'd like to thank you very much to, to you. And to each and every one of you who, are, who is um, here this evening, we'd like to appreciate you and say thank you very much for coming. Without an audience, I can imagine, only the three of us sitting here talking to one another. <laughs> There would, have, there would not have been any seminar. So on that note, we want to say thank you very much. To the UJ Library team, thank you very much for this beautiful auditorium. We appreciate your support, and we say thank you for, for that. And um, Dr. Moyani also said, I should thank my home faculty, which is Phoebe as well. All right. So thank you to Phoebe faculty and uh, some of my colleagues here this evening. Prof. Konta is here, and a couple of other colleagues and postgraduate students as well from Phoebe. Thank you very much for being here this evening. And uh, on that note, I would like to close, officially close this seminar and invite uh, Dr. Moyen for some few words. Thank you. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the chair. Please join me to give her You are the best. Thank you. And uh, this uh, seminar, um, as we said in the beginning, it was a collaboration between Confucius Institute and the library. And we're going to have quite a number of other seminars that are coming on a, on a number of areas. Um, we have very close um, relationship with the African, uh, Concern African Forum, 
and uh, the representatives are here. And uh, we will uh, go on. I was so impressed to hear someone from Vets University, my own alma mater. Um, and uh, yeah, and I know Aesop is from there as well. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's good that we keep on um, debating issues, um, study more, and uh, yeah, and become um, like uh, uh, all of uh, our panelists uh, here in front. <laughs>